just to get us going here, um, I want to note that Alder Boren is excused today. Um, and members of our committee here or uh, at City Hall include me, Marcus Savalio, Trey Mitchell. Um, Roberta, are you here? I am sure she will be, but we have a quorum, so we'll, um, we'll get started. Um, hang on just a sec here. Oh, and Bert's arrived. Very good. Um, if you will all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, those of you remote, if you would put yourselves on mute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. So let's get started. Um, I'd ask Todd to introduce everyone um, who is uh, in the chamber. If you would do that, Todd. Oh, sounds good. Uh, we have Vicki Schneider, HR, Marty Halverson, Finance, Eric uh, Bushman from IT, Chad Palachek from Development. Uh, visiting, we have Ryan Sorensen, Council President, uh, Carrie Ahrens, City Administrator Assistant, uh, Tara Dewey, um, Finance, Eric Mont Monti Montiello, close enough, um, Fire Chief, <laughs> Meredith, uh, City Clerk, um, Mike Vanderstein, Mayor, and then uh, we have Dulcie Johnson. That's all. All right. Very good, thank you. Um, and remotely, I see that we have Trey, um, Roberta, Felicki Pineski, Marcus Cavallio, Chuck Adams. Um, who is JNT? That's Judge Tory, all right. Um, is there anybody else we've missed? All right, very good. Um, I would ask for a, uh, going to uh, 2.1, an approval, a motion to approve our minutes of the September 28th meeting. So moved. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Perfect, thank you. Um, moving on. Um, 3.1 is submitting a communication from Dulcie Johnson regarding the ambulance fund budget. I do see a PowerPoint uh, up on the screen. Uh, Chief Montiano, is that yours in response to, um, to this uh, agenda item? Yes? Ah. No? They're just working on the microphone. Oh, there you are. The problem is he's, he, the PowerPoint's in the way. Oh, public lectern? Oh, that one. No. There you go. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you guys see the PowerPoint, uh, Alder Donahue? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, I was at the, a couple of the city council meetings and I was asked to put a presentation together uh, in regards to uh, Ms. Johnson's uh, inquiry. So hopefully I'll be able to answer her questions and, and present. So this is a little background on the ambulance service. Uh, so prior to the uh, fire department taking over, and the, actually in the police department used to provide that service uh, back in 1988 or up until about 1988. And then the city contracted services with the Orange Cross Private Ambulance Service. In 1994, Sheboygan Fire began training their staff at, at the AED and uh, first responder capabilities to provide better service to its residents. And then in 2008 is when we took over the ambulance service uh, and transport. 
So that's when uh, basically our emergency medical services began. And with that came the expenses. And obviously we had to lease vehicles since we didn't have ambulances at that time. Cardiac monitors for those life-saving issues, patient cots, obviously, and, and various other miscellaneous supplies and equipment. And of course, in order to meet this, the uh, number of uh, personnel, we had to increase our TO. Uh, we hired three uh, additional individuals and one extra uh, was added due to attrition. So we filled that spot that wasn't originally going to be filled. So in essence, four personnel were added to the 280 fund. And just a quick overview, since 2007, we, we had our uh, staffing levels at 74 uh, personnel. In 2008, we went up, like I said, those three individuals uh, to 77, which another one was added as well, bringing that total to 77 through that attrition. In 2011, we dropped our staffing, again, through attrition retirements to 72. 2016, it went down to 69. Finally, we were back able to get back to our minimum numbers of 73 sworn personnel. And, and the reason I say it's the minimum, we're still not quite where we need to be. However, we're making do with what we have. We have currently one individual that's uh, certified as a first aid CPR individual, 13 EMT basics, and 59 of our full-time personnel are considered paramedics. We have five stations strategically located throughout the city, and all stations are equipped with advanced life support apparatus, including the ambulances and engines. Not all stations have ambulances. All shift personnel can perform those advanced life-saving measures. We do have three full-time, fully staffed ambulances, full-time staff 24-7. Uh, they are equipped with state-of-the-art equipment in order to provide the highest level of care and including the trained paramedics. But they are also more than that. They're cross-trained, they play that dual role. We obviously serve our community with an all hazards approach, meaning that we are more than just EMS. We answer any fire calls, any 911 calls, any emergent, non-emergent calls. And by doing so, it also decreases the amount of cost that it would if you had these items separately because we would still have to maintain our ability to fight fires. By adding the EMS to the fire department, we uh, increased our capabilities and added that value added service. Uh, we raised the over overall quality of the responses. We increased staffing efficiency, again, by that dual role all hazards approach. Typically on a transport, you have two paramedics, but when you have the engine back them, not only does that initial life-saving care increase and is better uh, in long-term for the patients, but that suppression vehicle will also be in service a lot quicker. And then we enhanced our working relationship with Orange Cross, who was a private ambulance service in the county. So as you see in this graph here, we have quarterly meetings between our administrative Sheboygan personnel and Orange Cross administration to build that relationship, that working relationship up. We help them basically and they help us. And that graph here shows, or the table. In 2016, Orange Cross came to Sheboygan um, 22 times, but yet we went out 30 times. And 17, 51 times that we gave them help, and we received help 27 from them. So that's what the chart shows. And this year, up to date, so far, we've, we've uh, given them 54 calls for assistance while they've come 21. So it's a mutually, even though the numbers aren't identical, we have more staffing. We have a full-time crew. We can move engine crew members to the ambulances as well, so we can put that fourth ambulance in service whenever we need to help. So that's why those numbers are like that. This is just a quick breakdown of what our calls were like in 2019. So we ran uh, approximately 4,500 calls, uh, EMS calls that is, and about 1,100 uh, non-EMS related calls. And out of those, we also had 89 structure fires. 
And the reason that number is significant is because in order to provide the best suppression capabilities, safety aspect for our crews, we need uh, personnel. And right now we are running at a minimum uh, two vehicle, two suppression vehicle, two uh, uh, firefighters on those vehicles, which we need at least 15, according to NFPA standards, 15 personnel in order to mitigate a fire safely within the first five minutes of arrival. So having two individuals on an engine is, and two on the ambulance, it, it, we're, we're at the minimum. We ran over uh, 5,700 calls in 2019, so our call volume continues to increase. Uh, this graph here shows from 2015 on up. Uh, every year, obviously, can fluctuate a little bit, but the trends are going up. In 2019, we had 4,799 4, 4, patient contacts. That doesn't mean we transported all 4,799. However, EMS-related, we have that. And again, the trend continues to go up. So what does SFD constantly do? Well, we're evaluating and improving our services. So we, re we respond to all the EMS, over 4,000 annually, and they, they consist of all methods of 911 calls, whether somebody just needs assistance getting up because they can't, they're too frail or, or have other medical issues, or they actually need transports. Our crews respond to over 350 pediatric emergencies each year. And to prepare for them, that takes special training. So here, they're work you see this little slide, they're working on PALS training, which is pediatric advanced life support. That's just one aspect. We also do over 400 training hours annually for, in order to prepare to handle pediatric patients. Those are some of our most difficult. This synopsis here is just one aspect of the training the men and women of the Sheboygan Fire Department do to maintain their certifications as EMS providers. We are constantly, again, looking at other services we have provided or we can provide. We've added pumps, IV pumps to our uh, ambulances to also pr provide an advanced level of care. Hours and hours of continuing education are done every day, every month throughout the year. We've also added uh, the RTF capability, which is Rescue Task Force, for those active shooter incidences. Again, all our personnel are trained, not only our firefighters, but our paramedics, to be able to mitigate those situations. We've also uh, included some technical aspects that we didn't have in the past. So high angle, trench, below grade, building collapse. We've also added a new program, uh, surface water rescue. So again, these are all cross-trained individuals that are also paramedics. And so they're just not the technical rescue individuals. They're paramedics that are trained. So in order, again, to supplement and co keep the costs down, we do it all. We cross-train and train on uh, various aspects. In 2020, we will once again be able to build out for specialty care transfers, which allows the fire department to build out at a higher rate for those specialty services. Just this year alone, we've built approximately 45,000 for 30 inner facility transports. Out of those, we're going to hopefully see a potential revenue of over 20,000. The key thing to remember is the fire department is not in the profit business. That's not why we're here. We're here to provide services to the community. The ambulance fund truly is the only aspect of the fire service that can offset some of the costs for providing the services, not just the EMS services, but the ser services that we mentioned earlier. High angle, technical rescue, surface, structure fires, all those kinds of things are offset a little bit by the ambulance fund. This, this slide here gives you a little synopsis of what we have as far as revenues and expenses throughout the year. So uh, revenue in this case is the, the grants that we receive or our ambulance service fees. Uh, 
And some of the expenses are obviously personnel, vehicles, vehicle maintenance, and supplies and equipment. So you see here in the trend from 2015 on, on to today, and, and actually, so the 2020 year date actual, we're on track to beat what we expected. However, it's roughly a million, a million point three, a million point two, depending on the year. And our expensive expenses are relatively the same, about 600 bringing that grand total that goes into the general fund in, in the last line you see there. So in, so far in 2020, we're going to have about 400,000, but we still aren't done with that year. Last year, there was 800,000, 826 the year before, 600, 400, and then 700. Again, based on the call volume and the services, as we continue to increase our services, that should go up as well. This graph here shows, or this chart, I should say, shows the billable incidents that we ran since uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And you'll see those billable incidents are relatively the same, 3,200, 3,300, and 3,500. And what that means as you move down that chart is the gross charges for, in 2017 for those 3,291 calls, we, were, we could have charged $3,187,000 $3, and change. However, due to limitations by Medicare, Medicaid, and why the government puts on us, we could only charge 1,631,000 of the, those, out of those 3,291 calls. We were able to collect out of that 1.6 million, roughly 1.2 million. And that's pretty standard going down. We're able to collect about 1.2 million, and uh, we're on track to do the same this year, even though COVID interfered. So we're, we're on track for that as well. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, I apologize, in 2021, we will move one of our, uh, the assistant chiefs that oversees the EMS division over to the, from the 101 fund over to the 280 fund. But again, to, we cannot move everybody because they, they are also suppression individuals. They're not just paramedics. We don't have any uh, staff that is solely a paramedic. So even if we did work to move those all 22 individuals over there, it wouldn't be an accurate reflection. And the reason I have this slide in here, this is our mission statement. This is truly what I believe in and what our staff believes in and our personnel. And we, are, we take pride in holding to it. We're dedicated to serving all who live, visit, work, and invest in the city of Sheboygan through excellence in fire protection, rescue, emergency and non-emergency medical services, code enforcement, and education, and at the highest professional level in a compassionate, ethical, and cost-effective manner. And that is truly what we do. We are not solely paramedics. We are not solely worried about EMS. We respond to everything that we need to. When we're called, we, we, we respond. So on behalf of all the members of the Sheboygan Fire Department, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Um, as, as we have a uh, lengthy agenda, uh, what I'm going to do at this point is, uh, Ms. Johnson, if you have any uh, comments, brief comments that you would like to make, uh, I would ask that you do that, and uh, then we will need to move on. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my concern is that the department does not recognize the cost of the service. I realize it's a service. It's not a business. But I still think it would be helpful to account for the actual cost of the service. And that was one of the recommendations from the uh, consulting firm that analyzed the department probably three or four years ago. From a program accounting perspective, the city should consider adjusting their financials to, relect, to reflect 18 FTEs adjusted to 75% as a more representative cost allocation for EMS staffing requirements. And it's very simple to do that. I've been advocating this for 10 years, for goodness sakes. Um, 
I can give you the formula for doing that. And when you do that, you come up with different figures. You come up with um, the cost of uh, personnel <clears throat> is almost $2 million. And then you have other expenses that you add. <clears throat> and then you take your collections, which are $1.3 million. So you have a loss of about a $1 million, and probably more. Because the other thing that the department fails to include in their cost of the service is any administrative costs. And it doesn't run by itself. A few years ago, I went to the department. I had two simple questions that I wanted answered. It took four people to answer those questions. The chief was there with his notebook. The secretary was on her computer. A couple of times they had to call Deputy Chief Butler. And at one point, another man popped out of an office to add something to the conversation. So the department doesn't run itself. There are costs involved. And I'm realizing, I realize that it's a service but I still think it's important to know the cost of the service. And that's all I'm asking. Um, there was one thing that I didn't understand from the chief's report. He said, according to the um, annual report, there were 50 structure fires. You gave a much higher number, so I don't know where the discrepancy is in that. But it's very easy to figure the personnel costs of the four in the 280 budget, and 18 additional people who are needed to operate the ambulance service. That's all I'm asking, because we can't go around saying, well, the department took in a million dollars, made a million dollars last year. No, you did not. You did not. You lost money, actually. You lost almost a million dollars. And I, that's all I'm asking, is to have an accounting of the cost of the service. I know it's not going to change anything. Goodness, it's set in stone. But um, I think it would be important to know the actual cost of the service. And it's not that hard to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And um, uh, interesting subject. And I think we'll just, uh, again, because we have such a large agenda, we're going to move forward to um, um, Ashley, Chuck, do I need a motion to file the communications? Alder Donahue, oh, Alder Donahue, if I could just say, if if, uh, if Ms. Johnson wouldn't mind stopping by the fire station, I'd be glad to speak to her and justify and, and look at those numbers for her. Uh, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but thank you. All right. Chuck, do we need a motion to file? Yes, motion to file would be in order. Marcus Cavalli moves to file this document. Second. All right. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Again, thanks to all for the work involved in this. Um, let's move on to 3.2, which is a resolution authorizing uh, entrance into an intergovernmental cooperative agreement with Sheboygan County <clears throat> regarding sales tax revenue sharing. Who would like to take that? I can take that, Madam Chair. This is Marty. So uh, you'll notice in your packet that you have an IFC and an agreement between Sheboygan County and the city of Sheboygan. Uh, this uh, agreement between the city and Sheboygan has been in place since 2019. And the intention here is the county is uh, sharing their, a portion of the sales tax revenue uh, with the city of Sheboygan to be utilized for road repairs. Uh, in 2019, when the program started, there was a $411,000 allocation over to the city. And in 2020, there was a $450,671 uh, allocation. Earlier this year, the county had projected possibly dropping the allocation down to the 2019 amount of $411,000 as a result of the COVID pandemic. However, upon uh, receiving state uh, revenue and sales tax uh, reports, the state uh, revealed that we in Sheboygan County are actually exceeding expectations, and therefore the 2021 allocation is $445,526. Uh, this agreement is to be utilized for the 
road on um, Geely Avenue, North 3rd Street, and Calumet Drive. Uh, that total cost of that project is 700000 so uh, a good portion of that project will be offset with this sales tax revenue. Um, again, the document that's attached has the total transportation uh, budget that was in place for 2020 for the city as well as 2021. Uh, with that, I can answer any, any other questions. questions? Madam, Madam Chair, oh, I'm I, sorry. Th this is this is Alder this is Alder Sorensen. I, I I do have a question, if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, and, and Marty, I think this is for you. I'm, I'm kind of scanning over the the, the documents on here. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just I'm curious with the amount that we are receiving from the county. Is this an equitable amount of money that we're generating within the city limits? Does the county measure that at all? Um, the city just get, provides us a breakdown of all sure. the municipal or uh, taxing jurisdictions within the county and how much is going to it, but I, I don't know their methodology per se. Okay. Just was curious. The document that they utilize the is, is the last page in the document, how they come up with their percent. I mean, it, it appears that the city of Sheboygan receives 30%. How they come up with that... <clears throat> I don't. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was saying. Madam yeah. Chair, I, I can supply that information. Mayor Vanderstein, what the county did is they carved out initially $1.5 million out of the sales tax that they received. And they split that money up amongst all of the municipalities based on their equalized value. So they let whatever that percentage was at that particular time um, govern the, the monies in the future. So if sales tax revenues went up or down, that same percentage would be applied. So that's how they put that together. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I need a motion to uh, recommend that we enter into this intergovernmental cooperative agreement with Sheboygan County. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Further questions? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. All right, let's move on to 3.3, which is a letter authorizing the city to engage Quarles and Brady as uh, Quarles and Brady as bond counsel with respect to the taxable general obligation refunding bonds. Do we want any discussion on this or who's going to lead? I can take that. I have a question. Oh, yep. well, the explainer can go first. How's that? Okay. So, Madam Chair, the. Uh... Quarles and Brady Bond Council, as this is our third borrowing of the year, actually it'll be our fourth uh, actual uh, legal borrowing series. Uh, two of them were combined into one. Um, this is the similar council that is provided to us at each of our borrowings from Quarles and Brady to make sure that we're meeting all of the requirements for whether it be taxable, tax exempt, um, and all the other requirements related to a, a bond or notes offering. Uh, this borrowing is in relation to the refunding of the, or the advance refunding of the NANS related to tax incremental district number 18, the South Point Enterprise Campus. Thank you. Alder Felicki Paneski, question? Thank you. Um, I, th I just have a question about how we get to Quarles and Brady. Do we? Do we do an RFP every year? Do, how, how do we contract with Quarles and Brady? So at this point, uh, Quarles and Brady has been the uh, chosen bond council. Uh, I'm not sure when the last RFP was done, but I know currently our city attorney's office is putting one together to explore that for uh, beyond 2020. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? I need a motion to approve the engagement letter with Quarles and Brady. Move to approve the engagement letter. Do we Second. have a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? 
chair both sides. Okay. We will move on to 3.5, uh, a motion authorizing a, an amendment to the uh, offer to purchase with Martin's Killing True Value. A three, like um, Mary Lynn, 3.4, 3.4. Oh, did I skip over? Yes. Oh, I did. Just a little teeny tiny uh, little thing there, huh? Sorry about that. <laughs> resolution, I'm sorry, 3.4 is a resolution awarding the sale of $11,435,000 in taxable general obligation refunding bonds. And who has the pleasure of leading us in that discussion? I will take that as well, Madam Chair. Uh, the $11,435,000 is the estimated, uh, again, for the advance refunding. We are going to be having that sale take place. The planned date is next week, Monday. Uh, therefore, this will be the final sale results will get reported uh, right before next week's council meeting. Um, at this point, uh, I've not heard any uh, changes in the market uh, activity that would be adverse or adding uh, question to this advance refunding. So uh, we are continuing uh, forward as, as planned. We've had our brief call with Moody's. Uh, they will be providing us their uh, information. I believe it's, it actually I think is Wednesday. Um, and following that, uh, everything will be out in the marketplace and uh, the sale will take place then. And I presume that Carol Worth is guiding the city through this process again? That is correct. All right. Does anyone have any questions, concerns about markets? Go ahead. Uh, do you know what the uh, anticipated savings on this is, or the estimated savings on this is going to be? I knew somebody would ask that question, and I didn't have that document that we covered last time. Uh, give me one second. While you're looking, uh, do you have a, an estimate of what we should expect for an interest rate as well? Marty, what I would suggest is if you can send that out to the finance committee, uh, because those are two very good questions, um, you know, as soon as you can locate the information. Uh, Marcus, I assume this is not a deal breaker with respect to the resolution? Uh, not at this time. We can push it through and discuss the uh, at council with the commission. I, okay. I will have, I mean, I will have, will have the info. Savings. I'll have the info emailed out before the end of the evening. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm assuming we're saving money, and I'm assuming yes. we have a decent interest rate, but, you know, Save, to verify, right? Saving funds was not the primary objective. I mean, it, it sort of is at the same time. I mean, we are going to be getting a, a lower interest rate, I mean, from the 3.6 that was out there to, you know, roughly around 2% is, is my recollection. I think it was like 1.9%. Um, so there is definite savings involved, but the, the importance here is taking advantage of and locking into that low interest rate uh, market right now instead of having to do the mandatory refinancing or refunding in June of 2023. By doing a taxable refunding, what it allowed us to do was also capitalize some interest uh, for an additional two years uh, to assist us in the delay in the development of South Point Enterprise Campus. All right, any other questions? I'm looking for a motion to uh, recommend the uh, issuance of approximately $11,435,000 in general obligation refunding bonds. I'd make so, that motion. Yep. Second. All right, any further discussion? <coughs> Note that we have a meeting scheduled of this committee prior to the council meeting uh, next Monday at 5.30. And that will be to, I presume, to, to uh, see what the results of the sale are and to, and to go forward. So all in favor, state aye. 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 
Any opposed? Chair votes aye. The motion passes. Okay, let's go on now to 3.5, uh, which is a resolution authorizing city officials to execute an amendment to offer um, the offer to purchase with Martin's Killing True Value hardware. It looks like this is a change of the closing date. So I can take this, Madam Chair. This is Chad Pelishek. Um, this was a originally the offer to purchase that was accepted between the two parties was to close no later than October 31st. This will extend it out until the end of December, um, primarily because they're working. They've completed a phase one, and the phase one environmental assessment has um, shown enough to move forward in a phase two. So under the county's EPA grant, they're funding a phase two that's underway now, but isn't going to be time isn't it going to be completed in time to close for the end of the year? So staff is recommending extending this out to the end of the year. So, Chad, does the offer, I presume, has a contingency that if there is more extensive environmental remediation needed that the sale won't go through? There's an opportunity, yes, for that. We're hoping that um, it's, it's just historic uh, materials, if you will, underneath there, and that it's not going to be enough to stop them from putting a basically a building on grade at that location. So... Um, at this point, I don't think uh, Trilling is, he just wants to make sure that what he's buying is, makes sense for him, but he's willing to, you know, work through because he knows what the prior use was. Um, but they're just making sure that there's no contamination really coming from the gas station to the south and east of this property. Okay, so we are looking, any other questions, comments? We're looking for a motion to approve the execution of an amended uh, offer to purchase. Move to approve. Second. All right. Any other discussions? Hearing none, all in favor, state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Okay. Now, um, and I'm going to. Chuck, I just don't remember, so I'm going to defer to you. So we have a resolution establishing the budget appropriations and the tax levy. It would be my proposal to work through the budgets from each department. Um, so going from 3.7 down to 3.16, and then uh, and then entering into the resolution, or is there a better way? Oh, that is correct. Think of it as 3.6 and then 3.6A through whatever. Uh, so 3.6 will be the final thing that you do. Okay. And if I may, well, the only, uh, um, I'm not involved in this. If, if I may be excused, I'd like to move to my next meeting. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Chuck before he shuffles off to Buffalo? All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, I'm going to wait to uh, um, entertain the motion until we have had the uh, presentations from our various um, uh, uh, departments, uh, unless there is an objection. And so we will start with 3.7, which is Common Council, City Clerk, and Elections. Is that Meredith? They're just connecting the microphone. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have a lot to add to anything that was included in your packets, but I'm here to answer any questions. Um, the budgets really remained the same for those three um, budgets, except for elections went down quite a bit because of the two elections next year compared to the four this year. And there was a little increase in the council budget um, due to contracted services for community and staff engagement programming. Right. Hey, Mary Lynn, it's Ryan. Can I ask a question. quick question? Yep. As, as Todd chuckles. Um, mm -hmm. Just a quick question for you, Meredith. Yes. For the elections, are you guys still projecting? I'm holding you to a quick question, uh, Alder Sorensen. Oh, oh, do you know? Okay, it should be a quick question, I hope. Um, 
just in terms of, of uh, next year's budget for elections, are you still anticipating a high rate um, for absentee ballot requests? And does that number reflect um, what what is in your budget? We put in money that COVID is still as it is now. Okay. So like the cleaning of the polling locations, the increase of absentee, we planned as though we would run both elections with COVID still going. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. See, that was quick, right? All right. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, if no one objects, um, Judge Torrey, you, you had sent a message that you were having trouble um, hearing or uh, uh, participating. Oh, your microphone is on. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I think if the group does not mind, we'll let Judge Tory go next, just in the interest of, uh, of time. And just to locate our audience, which means I need to locate my agenda, that would take us down to uh, 3.12. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so primarily what we look at with, with the court budget each year is, is just projections for what we are projecting for, for revenue is to be, which are basically a result of forfeitures that are collected um, and then projections for citations um, that we would have processed. And so I can tell you that this year, uh, because of COVID, the amount of citations that we've received is down 29.77%. Uh, so we've seen a huge drop um, in the amount of citations being written um, by the, the Sheboygan Police Department and by the um, Building Inspection um, Department. Polar Police is, is up, which is interesting, and I, and I don't have any um, commentary besides to say that the drop is, is just all due to uh, Sheboygan um, Department. Um, what else is interesting, though, is that um, that rate does not uh, transfer to um, the decrease in, in forfeitures collected. So collections are currently down, but only 9%. So we have citations currently down 29% of forfeitures that are being paid only down 9 And I And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we still do have so much outstanding from all the, the previous years that the court has been in existence, and, and we collect on those. Um, with the state debt collection. And, and so it would take quite a while for us to see such a huge drop uh, in, in forfeitures being paid that would be similar um, to the, to the um, citations being written. And also, interestingly, um, we did note people used their uh, tax funds to pay forfeitures to the court and, and, and told us that. Um, we've tried to do what we can to stay open um, we're now back to virtual court um, due to some COVID in the, the city attorney's office. Today, I found out that there are some cases of COVID in the in the circuit court. So just to be um, safe, we, we are back to virtual court. But our budget just basically reflects um, that we are projecting um, our forfeitures for next year to, to be down. Um, uh, and, I, it, and again, it, it, it's always a guess, um, but that would be the biggest change is that we're projecting um, forfeitures to be down and then also the citations. Sorry, can my microphone muted. That's yeah. uh, Questions for Judge Tory? Um, Judge Tori, are your staff working um, in the police department or from home? Right. Uh, we've been here at the municipal court um, full time, so they're they're still here every day. Um, it's just that they don't have to have contact um, with with the public. We're doing all all of our court, even when we were in person. We were we were um, virtual from March to June. And we were in person for trials just until I think it was just last Wednesday and we were told about the situation in the city attorney's office. And um, 
but we had we're doing initials virtually the whole time just because we still run up to a potential of over 400 initial appearances on a Wednesday and, and that just seems irresponsible and that's worked well we do have some wonderful um, renovations to the courtroom that are scheduled for later this month where we'll really be able to um, not just have more um, accessibility for people virtually, but even it, when they are here, we'll be able to have um, a hearing loop, just better audio equipment. Um, so um, we're trying to distance um, from the, from unnecessary contact, but, but the staff is still here every day. All right. Chair? Other questions? Chair? Go ahead. Uh, this is Todd Wolf. Um, what what Judge Tory is uh, referencing is the technology updates that we are we are doing at uh, the municipal court uh, by using uh, CARES dollars. Um, so that we're using monies from that fund to to pay for technology upgrades. So that'll help us with uh, with the COVID and being able to bring um, more more activity to them in a virtual manner. Excellent. All right. Anything else for Judge Tory? All right. Let's go back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go back to 3.8, Department of Planning and Development. Chad? Thank you. So just to run through the 18 funds or so that are in our department, so in the city development budget there's no notable changes proposed in 2021 in fund 219 which is a community development block grant program we've received an allocation of nine hundred and seventeen thousand eight hundred and ninety dollars um, that has already been programmed by the council previously to a number a variety of different projects around the city um, in the housing revolving re loan fund fund 223 this is the program that we uh, collect payments for housing rehabilitation uh, loans for low-income residents to make improvements to their house. Uh, we typically like to fund up to five projects at about 25000 a year is our goal, although uh, we like to say we're the lender of last resort. So if they need us, they come to us. But when the market is good, um, people not coming to us isn't all bad either. Um, we also fund staff time out of this fund. And in 2021, we're not projecting any major changes except for possibly the reprogramming of some of those funds into other activities. Um, in the business revolving loan fund, <laughs> fund 224, um, this is based on uh, creating, giving loans to new businesses uh, that create low to moderate income jobs. Um, our yearly goal for this is five uh, new jobs ranging from 25,000 to 500,000. Uh, there's no notable changes in this fund, although the uh, fund 223 and 224 have significant fund balance projected for both at the end of 2020 and at the end of 2021. And we are in, in initial discussions with the, city attorney, with the city administrator and the finance director about looking at reprogramming some of those funds uh, to get them out in the street versus sitting in the savings account. Um, under Fund 250, the Neighborhood Revitalization Fund, this is a new fund that was established last year to take the extension of TID 11 and capture one year's revenue. Um, we have rolled out two new programs this year, an upper floor residential rehab program and a facade and landscaping program for key corridors. Um, so we just did that in the late, uh, that probably in August, so we're looking to continue these uh, programs into 2021 and fund them out of this fund. Um, two, fund 260, the tourism fund, is a conglomeration of a number of uh, places, so it receipts the room tax dollars that's received from the hotels. Um, there is expenses in there for 4th of July and for Fountain Park for police and DPW services. Um, there's also expenses in there for advertising and marketing, marketing and city green. We're not anticipating any changes to that fund other than some of the revenue changes um, based on the room tax collection. Uh, the Redevelopment Authority Fund, Fund 295, there's no notable changes for that. Uh, TID 12 Capital Projects Fund, Fund 2422, this is the 
uh, Niagara Avenue in downtown Sheboygan. There's no uh, planned changes in that fund. Fund 424, the capital projects fund for TID 14. This includes Festival Foods, Taylor Heights, and the recently completed Meyer. Um, there's no projects planned in that district in 2021. Uh, TID 16 is the downtown TID along A Street from the river to Niagara Avenue. Uh, we've done substantial work out of that fund, and in 2021, um, there's no plans for uh, projects. TID 17 is Indiana Avenue revitalization, so there's three projects planned in there. Uh, one of them should be if the development of Pentair happens, Redevelopment and sale of Pentair would be to extend South Pier uh, Drive somehow through that property. There's also land acquisition for the Indiana Avenue Trail project along Union Pacific, and then some streetscape improvements, and that these projects would be funded with future city borrowings. TID 18, Fund 28, is the South Point Enterprise Campus um, and part of the Stonebrook subdivision that was recently approved. There's no planned expenditures in that district in 2021. In TID 19, the Capital Projects Fund, um, this is the area LTC, Dalma State Core, kind of the river. Um, the plan is to extend this to accommodate redevelopment of the former main line. Uh, there's two projects in that district plan. One is a boardwalk extension if the main line property should redevelop, and then North Commerce Street reconstruction project. And then TID 20 is a recently created TID for the Vandervaart development. Um, and the project in there would be to upgrade the intersection of South Business Drive and Georgia Avenue to make it a signalized intersection. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, just to let everybody know, we also, I do also oversee the building inspection department, but they report to the licensing hearings and public safety committee. Uh, Chad, I had a quick question. Um, how is the uh, upper story rehab uh, grant program going? Um, I th we've awarded uh, three projects and are working on three projects. So um, we had our goal was to get five, five projects under contract in 2020, and I think we'll be close to doing that. Great. Is, is that, are those mostly downtown? Um, yeah, they're on key corridors, Indiana Avenue, uh, A Street, and then um, one might be South 12th Street. Okay. All right. um, other questions for Chad? All right, hearing none. Let's go to the finance department, Marty. Madam Chair, if we can move that one to the last, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable letting everyone else go first. Okay. Save the best for last, huh? Um, city Administrator. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the, the numbers from, uh, let's see. If we look at uh, 2020 uh, uh, amended, uh, we, uh, Carrie and I did make some adjustments to that. Um, so what we did for 2021 executive um, is we took 4,000 out of the uh, intern salary. We're not looking to have an intern in 2021. Uh, contracted services, we, we took $7,500 out of the budget for uh, the removal of the ClearGov annual subscription. Um, we took out... Uh, 480 for the new gov uh, news hound e newsletter we took out 315 for the survey monkey that was something that was actually being used uh, by multiple departments so we'll be doing some sharing uh, took out 290 for we canceled the uh, Milwaukee Business Journal we took out 226 um, and we increased the ICMA or actually we didn't we took it out but it's an increase of the ICMA membership uh, to reflect um, my position. Uh, we increased the WCMA uh, summer conference by uh, $575 uh, to match the winter conference, uh, assuming that that's gonna continue on. Uh, training and conferences, we increased training conferences 
by five thousand dollars to support uh, my my new position, and then we um, also took out we removed the PAFRA app um, of minus uh, subtracting out four hundred and fifty dollars, and then we increased the uh, the uh, new administration public relations by uh, one thousand one hundred and fifty dollars. So overall, that was a negative. 4,856 4, overall. And then in training and conferences, we did increase that um, by $6,680 overall. 800, uh, 875 is the WCMA summer conference. Uh, 875 is the WCMA winter conference. Uh, previously, both were attended by my predecessor. $2,800 is uh, Munis annual conference, and that's for Cary. We have 2897 ICMA annual conference, uh, pre previously attended by my predecessor. We have $395 for League of Municipalities, previously attended uh, by my predecessor uh, through the Urban Alliance. $805, the League of Municipalities Chief, Chief Executive Workshop and annual conferences. And then $5,000 was uh, allocated for new, new administrator support training um, as needed. That's, uh, that's what I have at this time. Questions Any? for Todd. All right. Hearing none, let's go on to uh, Office of the Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, in personnel services, um, in, in 2018, that number was a little bit higher, but we had uh, Mary Rager stay over and overlap with Sarah when she became uh, the new uh, Mayor's Assistant and Communication Specialist. They went down a couple of years in between and uh, this year, the mayor's finally going to get a raise of 2%, and so that personnel area is going to be going up just a little bit. On uh, person, non-personnel services, uh, office and equipment, that's for a shared copier for the office. IT services is staying pretty close. Telephone is pretty close to last year. Internet, they give us that number and we plug it in. Uh, publications and subscriptions is remaining minimal at the Sheboygan Press. And um, training and conferences is going up about 1,500 from last year. Um, and uh, this year, of course, that number went down quite a bit because of COVID, there was no travel. Uh, car allowance, uh, the van that uh, I use and other people in City Hall is in the, the Department of Public, Public Works. And this is the amount that they give us uh, for uh, maintain, maintaining it. Um, office supplies is uh, staying pretty steady. Community relations, uh, that number is uh, going to be, again, pretty much the same as last year. And uh, small office equipment is going down. Are there any questions? Anyone have any questions for the mayor? All right, thank you. Let's move along then to uh, 3.13 WSCS Cable TV. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric, is that yours? <clears throat> thank you. So, um, just touch on the highlights here. We're looking at a decrease of about eleven thousand dollars in contracted services. Main contributor to that is, and I apologize, it shouldn't be the elimination, but it's because we accomplished that upgrade this year, so we don't need to do it next year. Additionally, we're seeing reduction in operating expenses due to the new City Hall Common Council technology upgrades that we did with the City Hall renovation. That helps us reduce the cost to get the transmission uh, to the studio for broadcast. Any questions? Well, that was quick. No tough questions? Come on. All right. Thank you very much. And do you want to just step up then with um, 
our uh, IT department. Yes, Madam Chair. So once again, the highlights on here is uh, on the incoming revenues. We are again this year uh, increasing our charge back to the de uh, departments by 6%, which is uh, roughly $60,000. This increase allows us to invest in technologies to make the city more efficient and to make our systems more secure. Um, you also will see the miscellaneous revenue is significantly decreasing from about 367,000 down to about 4,000. The main factor there is the large part of that is the uh, uh, CARES Act funding. Um, working with finance, we decided to drive most of the technology changes for all the departments across the city through the IT department and uh, use our accounts. So that's the significant decrease there. Oh, under computer maintenance, we're seeing about an $18,000 increase. Uh, the contributing factor there is uh, much of the data center equipment that we purchased back in 2017, 2018, as we moved out of City Hall and spun up the data center at the wastewater treatment plant is coming off of warranty, so we need to put it on maintenance. The other uh, increase will be under contracted services. We're putting additional monies in the contracted services next year to assist us with the outside contracting help for the Munis upgrade. The other issue there is once again, the IT small equipment, you're seeing that drop significantly from 362,000 down to 14,000. And that is because that's the account we're using for the CARES Act. Any questions? Hey, Madam. Um, I, I, am, I am not used to seeing such a significant percentage of a budget in a line called miscellaneous. Uh, I did hear that the CARES Act money was in there, but what else gets flushed into miscellaneous? So in, in the miscellaneous revenue, what is in there is, <clears throat> once again, we're leveraging the CARES Act fund to, uh, as we talked about, the uh, municipal court room is being upgraded with technology to assist them in hosting remote uh, courtrooms. We are also upgrading two conference rooms at DPW to support uh, virtual meetings. We are upgrading two additional conference rooms at City Hall to uh, support, once again, remote workforce and virtual meetings. Additionally, we took a look at all the employees across the city that if COVID were to get uh, much worse than it is today and we needed to support them from working from home, uh, what, e what equipment would we need to support that? So we've gone out and uh, purchased laptops for those employees as well as um, um, uh, extra monitors, uh, wireless keyboard and mouse. Also, um, a second factor authentication to make their connection back to us more secure. So that makes up the bulk of that $360,000. So would I anticipate that next year, that miscellaneous item won't be that large? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions for Eric? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Let's move along to the Senior Services Department 3.15. Vicki? Thank you, Madam Chair. So the notable uh, changes or highlights for the Department of Senior Services would be the addition of a staff person who would be the program services coordinator. Uh, this offers some stability for the senior center overall. It's going to be subsidized and supported through the Friends of the Senior Activity Center. They will be covering the expenses uh, for all of 2021 for this position. Um, we will also be using this position to support wellness initiatives, which we are expecting will reduce some of our, or hope to reduce some of our healthcare expenses by keeping our employees engaged 
in our wellness programs and, um, and we'll hopefully reduce our costs in that. Uh, the other notable, uh, we did reduce one employee. It was the very uh, part-time position uh, was our custodian who had uh, been supporting the Senior Activity Center and with the changes in the building that occurred over the summer that we no longer had a need for that position at this time, so that position was, was eliminated. Um, the other piece on, if you look at the budget for contracted services, we did do a considerable increase in that area due to the changes of the building and what we are anticipating will be expenses uh, in 2021 with the conversion into a new site. Questions for Vicki? Marcus? Could you elaborate on what uh, you're anticipating for that contracted services to cover? Uh, well, there'll be quite a few things with remodeling. There could also be program expenses as far as what those furnishings might look like in the new site as well. As, well, it's going to be that building is going to need a complete remodel. And so we're anticipating that we will have uh, some support that will be needed through the city's funds for that. Thank you. Uh, if uh, Marty could explain why that's in, um, in, in operational rather than a capital outlay, uh, please. At this point, we're not sure exactly what these uh, items could look like. They could be operational in nature in programming needs. They could be planning uh, expenses, such as with engineers, architects, or other consultants to uh, look at the flow of that building and how to utilize it most effectively. Um, without any concrete development plans, we don't at this point have a capitalization uh, plan for those expenses then. Thank you. Bert, um, I was looking at the healthcare line under personal services, and there is a 45% increase in that budget line. Is there a reason for that? I am looking. Can you tell me again what line you're looking at? Uh, I am looking at uh, line 510340. Chair? Chair? Yes. No, this is Todd. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, what you're seeing is basically a change in the insurance with the uh, with the, the the team that we have so that's why you're seeing such an increase we have a, a new we'd like to know what the change is. right well in in planning for our new positions we have a new director that's coming on board and the city always looks at the family plan first full coverage insurance um, hoping that you know obviously we we don't have to have that, but you, when, when you're hiring a new position, we always look at the higher cost versus the lower cost for budgeting purposes. Plus we also have the new, uh, the transfer of Rachel. And the reason that she's coming over is that she needs the insurance. So that's another additional cost that wasn't in our, our past numbers. That's why you're seeing the increase. If I may, then that is where the friends are also subsidizing the cost of her health uh, insurance for 2021. Correct. So there, there was, there's a change in the plan. No, the the what you're seeing, um, Roberta, is the fact that we we transferred it to a full, uh, the staff to a full um, insurance package not knowing exactly who we're going to be hiring and what they're going to come in requesting. So it's, it's really just a budgetary for the new director. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Let's move on to uh, HR, please. That's me. Okay, some of the uh, highlights from, uh, in general, of human resources has been that 
We've done a realignment of staff with human resources and with uh, finance. So we have a total of five employees. Um, as you will see that we have added the administrative services clerk to position uh, from, well, that was added in the middle of 2020 so that we could have some additional support. We have a decrease in contracted services of $6,500. That was a contracted software program that, that had been underutilized, and we will not be continuing that in 2021. We will also have an increase in training and conferences as we have three of our five uh, HR employees are new to, in 2020. So we will be um, wanting to support them through training and to introduce them into conferences as well as uh, networking experiences through the city. Um, we also had an additional uh, increase in our wellness initiatives. We're going to a program that's called Go365, and we want to make sure that we have uh, that well-funded, as well as that will be another support piece that the program coordinator from the Senior Activity Center will have a portion of that role to uh, roll out that initiative to all employees. We are again trying to focus on wellness and hopefully then decreasing our expenses and our health care costs. So that's our overall uh, human resources fund. If you are okay, I'll go on to the next pages. Go right ahead. Okay. So looking at the health insurance fund, uh, the budget highlight for this is that we were able to, as a city, uh, make a contribution to the HSA accounts for 2021. So that's uh, averaging an increase in $375,000. That will amount to $750 for a single plan and $1,500 for an employee plus or an employee with family. Um, we are presenting that information to employees currently, and the feedback has been extremely positive that we're able to do something uh, for the employees in in this time period. The, uh, the $3 million requirement to hold in that fund, um, we are at $4.2 million currently, or as we expect to be ending in 2020, so we feel that we're very comfortable being able to offer that. And, um, and then in the workers' comp fund, we really have not had anything... Uh, significant this year and so we're not we always will budget to be conservative in that as we don't know what could happen in the future that fund we have a 1.5 million requirement fund balance and we are just at over 2 million uh, in the workers comp fund right now and that's all I have questions for Vicki Marcus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if you could take a look at the health insurance fund under non-personal services stop loss, what is that? So the stop loss is what we, we enter into an, a, an insurance agreement so that if there is an individual who has a claim that is uh, significantly high, that stop loss kicks in. Right now we budget at $165,000 that will come out of uh, the city's uh, funds, and if a, a, a person exceeds that or a claim exceeds that, that stop-loss insurance will help cover those additional expenses. <laughs> so just for clarity, we are budgeting three-quarters of a million dollars to cover high expenses of insurance on the part of our employees? This that, that is correct. And that is... that. Um, that has been shopped out by our brokers, and so they felt that that was a reasonable uh, expenditure as we did have a difficult year in 2019 and in 2020 with a, a couple of individuals who have very high cost uh, health, health needs. Thank you. Other questions for Vicki? All right, thank you so much. Um, let's go back up then to 
uh, 3.6, which is a resolution establishing the 2021 budget appropriations and the 2020 tax levy for use during the calendar year. And Todd, do you want to take that? Or Marty, your choice. Madam Chair, do you want uh, myself to go through some of the finance department areas first? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. You were going to, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Uh, as in the uh, IFC, I'm not going to go through everything line by line, certainly try to keep this uh, a little bit briefer, but I'll expand on some of the major changes. So specifically in finance in 2020, we've gone through a fair number of staffing changes where we've brought on a new deputy finance director. We brought in an accountant three, our accountant one, who was a shared employee with HR and finance became all finance has since resigned and we have now an open position that will be uh, filling along with an AP, uh, AP clerk purchasing assistant who retired. All the net changes of all of that led to about a 0.6 FTE increase. Uh, however, there are some in instances as Todd mentioned where when you budget with a open position, we budget the most conservatively on, from an ex expense standpoint and put in the most uh, costly family plan with the intention that that's not always going to be the case. But uh, those are the staffing changes that did take place with some health insurance uh, impacts with the open positions. We have a decrease in our uh, contracted services for the consultant as a result of bringing on uh, appropriate staffing levels. Um, and then one of the prioritized and highly uh, aware of needs for the finance department is training and therefore we have uh, quite a bit of training uh, planned heavily focusing on munis training uh, gfoa or government finance officers accounting uh, academy training and then some ellers uh, updates and refreshers which focus on levy limits as well as a, a wgfoa the wisconsin chapter uh, conference so all of the changes for finance lead to an overall increase of 116,290 uh, over last year's budget. And again, primarily that's the, uh, in a sense, up staffing as well as increasing the uh, type of staff that's in place. Um, other than that, the other noted item that I wanna put on there, um, Todd Wolf, uh, city administrator, has uh, certainly had some conversations with uh, several uh, of the leadership ch uh, cabinet for the council in regards to uh, moving along from the employee benefits, which was a uh, department org within uh, the budget book. The intention of that org or cost center was to always capture expenses of individuals who would uh, leave the city and we would have payout, no, I guess, mainly along a retirement standpoint. Uh, however, it has been the city's practice to incorporate all those expenses into their own departments. And therefore, despite having this budgeted for multiple years, um, I'm not even sure how far back it goes, but it does go back several years before I came on board. Uh, but however, there's never been anything expense to it. And therefore, we have moved that uh, budget to across the board in the general fund and no longer uh, in that specific cost center. Uh, the unclassified is one area that we have not finalized in the sense that our contingency as done in the past, we always toward the tail end last minute following any discussions and potential other changes, uh, we maximize our contingency to allow no loss of expenditure restraint program opportunity. We don't want to leave any dollars on the table. Um, and we've had some conversations with Don Gunderson from Ellers regarding that. So it's a juggling act sort of between your levy limitation and your expenditure restraint program. Uh, currently the 400,000 in there, I think our, our goal would be to double it from a budget standpoint with the intention that we would not need it nor utilize it. However, uh, there has been instances where we recognize uh, $400,000 on a $40 million uh, budget is just not uh, adequate. Um, and that's the general fund finance department section. I think what I'll do is I'll keep going through everything and then 
Uh, you can ask questions at the end of that. From a special revenue funds perspective, the tourism fund, again, this really gets at the kind of the sales tax and use of our hotels. Uh, you know, I think what we're realizing is COVID has not hit Sheboygan County quite as hard as others, and therefore, um, we are doing a decrease in our revenues in the tourism fund by almost 550,000, um, which ultimately has an impact of decreasing the contracted services of 382,000, as that's the line item then that we pay out to the commission. Um, and so the net effect through the inner fund transfer is just a, a reduction of 54,626 to the general fund. Um, Another uh, key change in the special revenue would be Harbor Center Marina Fund. After talking to Matt Bauer, you know, we actually in 2020, boating has been something that individuals have been able to do, um, you know, and, and therefore uh, they actually are, are expecting to have a pretty decent year in 2020. And as a result, they also believe that if COVID continues, not that we all want it to, 2021 actually uh, could become a, a decent year as well. Um, in order to support all of that, there is a, an increase in the operation expenses of $20,000 related to the labor um, operating and cost of sales. Uh, they also are planning some capital expenditures of $75,000 as we're doing some remodeling of that space where they're in upstairs. Um, from the debt service funds, I'm going to item, uh, there's only a couple that I'm going to item identify in here of some key takeaways, but certainly after I'm done with everything, feel free to ask me questions on any of them. From the convention center, that's the second bullet point, uh, there, we're decreasing the interfund transfer as there's no transfer to TID 16. Uh, that convention center debt service fund does not have the funds to really continue that transfer. Uh, TID 13, which is about halfway down, uh, we are going to be uh, in having an increase in our expenditure of 173914 and, and a major part of that is due to the interfund transfer to TID 17, which is one of our newer uh, TIDs. And then TID 14, which is right below it, we have an expenditure increase of 388600 and that's, that's due to a developer incentive. Uh, TID 17, as I just had mentioned, uh, the inner fund transfers are coming in from TIDs 12 and 13, which are similar like uh, TIDs. That's the only way you can transfer between them is if they are classified the same way with the state, and they are. So there's an increase in TID 17 uh, from a revenue perspective of 708425 uh, TID 18, that's where you're going to notice and recognize some significant swings in dollars, and that's really due to the timing related to the NAN refunding. Uh, the NAN is being refunded in 2020, where we will receive the funds put into escrow, so we need to recognize uh, those revenues come, that revenue coming in, because in a governmental accounting, that's revenue coming in when it's received, and then in 2021 is when we will be paying off. So the expenditure increase of 10826741 is related to those NANs being paid off. What happens is it, it flows in, it sits in your fund balance over the course of that, that year end right there, and then it's paid out of the fund balance and shown as an expenditure the following year. Um, in regards to the capital improvement funds, um, again, in TID 17, we are planning a borrowing uh, for some of the capital projects related to there, so that's why there's an increase in revenues. Uh, of 866,713. Uh, and in TID 18, we're ex increasing the expenditures by $185,000 um, as the capital is increased by 193,000 as we finish up uh, any last minute infrastructures that are capitalized. Uh, TID 19, the capital project fund, we do have an anticipated borrowing in there. So the uh, revenues are up by just shy of $2 million. Um, and in TID 20, our newest TID, we are uh, expecting an increase in expenditures of 685000 due to the capital outlay, and that TID 20 is that Oscar development. So that would be why the, the change is there. Uh, liability insurance fund, we're not anticipating any notable changes, nor in the cemetery perpetual fund. Um, and I, at this point, there are some other items that we are recognizing that will be changed. Um, the debt service funds, there's 
six changes that are taking place across five funds um, due to chewing up some of the numbers. Uh, the net effect is grand total favorable of $53,182. Um, it has to do with chewing up, like I said, some interest expense and, and numbers that uh, we finalized in there. Um, and then as the fire chief Maniano had mentioned earlier in his presentation, our intention is to now move uh, the assistant fire chief who oversees the ambulance service. We're gonna be moving that uh, expenditure and benefits from 101 General Fund Fire Department Cost Center over to the Ambulance Fund 280. Um, and as a result of that expenditure coming over to 280, we will reduce the uh, related inner fund transfer back to the general fund. That's where, as Todd mentions, you know, it's kind of a back and forth on the uh, transactional uh, financial impact because what has happened in the past is we transfer a, an inner fund transfer amount in the ambulance fund back to the general fund to offset administrative overhead that is not allocated as well as uh, we have costs for those ambulances. Um, the, the discussion that has not strategically been finalized yet is where do we want to carry that fund balance, whether we carry a larger fund balance in the ambulance fund 280 to pay for future ambulances, or whether we continue the approach of cost transferring over to the general fund and purchase them that way. Um, as we develop that plan, it'll be communicated out. And that at this point would be the known adjustments that still need to be made. Questions for Marty? Marcus? Thank you. Marty, could you uh, help me understand the Harbor Marina situation? Um, there's $20,000 being spent in operations for the marina, but how I understand it, the marina is uh, contracted with a private entity to operate it. I don't understand. That's correct. There is a, an increase, an inflationary increase in that contract, which I believe, if I recall, runs through 2023. Um, and that increase, uh, coupled with other operating expense changes, uh, one of the things that Matt did hint at was the fact that Labor is difficult to, quality labor is difficult to find, and there is some potential labor increases that he'd have to uh, have fun, funnel it through there. So some of the uh, net impact of, of operating that does impact the city. Uh, I guess uh, if you could provide me more clarity here, um, are, are we paying for the labor for a private entity to run a business? No, but what we are paying for is the increase in their fees then to us. And so as they increase, have a, an inflationary increase in there, um, we end up ultimately paying for those types of increase. That's how they justify their inflationary increases. I think I'm more confused than when I first asked this question, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, it comes down to the nature of, of, the, of the marina. Uh, Todd, can you jump in? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, Alder Mar uh, Marcus, the, the issue is that as the cost for the F3 to run the, um, the actual marina, according to our contract, we basically, the city has to compensate for those increases. Um, at, so as, as labor costs go up or material costs go up, the city actually in, contractually has to pay uh, the difference accordingly. So we have, I believe, two years, two years left, three years approximately on that contract. Um, we're hoping to see some decreases in costs as they open up. Um, I believe there's a, a bar that's going to be opening up or a, um, that'll be going into the uh, wine bar location. So hopefully we'll see additional traffic through there and hopefully in 2021, we'll see an increase in, in uh, activity in the, in the marina. We did see some activity increase towards the end, um, but obviously COVID has, has been a detriment to, to all businesses. Thank and you. To add to that, 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 is, a, that is a separate agreement. Pardon? 
but I think we need to understand that the marina is ours. It is. The marina is our and is our property. Somebody, we, we pay somebody to operate it. Correct. To manage and operate it, I yes. See. Okay. Yeah, so they, yeah, it's an odd arrangement, but you know, there you go. And so they're not compensated off of the profit that they bring in. They're compensated just to run the thing. So they, how how do they have a stake in, um, like like shouldn't they shouldn't they share in our success and not just pass every cost on to us? Well, <laughs> it's a contractual relationship. So I mean, it's not like we're. Um, you know, brothers in the same business, for example. Um, it's, uh, we pay them to try to make the marina profitable, which for many, many, many years it has not been, uh, and lately has been more profitable than it used to be. And uh, so it's, um, we are generally satisfied with the quality of services that these folks provide. And uh, their job is to bring more people into the marina to make it more profitable. Uh, so, you know, and to some extent, I think they've done that. I mean, isn't that a fair statement, Todd? Yes, it is. Or Chad, or yeah, the, I, I guess another way to look at it, um, Marcus, is uh, when you look at the the revenue dollars are estimated in the development of a contract and agreed upon by both parties, but then there's a, a stipulation in there that if if certain targets aren't met, um, like a pandemic situation, uh, the, the city does step in and help um, control costs also. But they F3 has done a fantastic job, and they've been showing increased um, revenue uh, prior to COVID. So I think the city overall has been very pleased with uh, with the management that they've been providing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Todd, I'll be reaching out to you for a, a good look at that contract uh, moving forward, not to hold up this meeting too much and too much more. It is it is two contracts with F3 because one is to operate the marina and one is to operate the new restaurant. That's that's where some of the variable costs come into play. Yeah, and this restaurant hasn't opened up yet. So mm -hmm. I turned on a different light and I have turned yellow. So <laughs> I am going... <laughs> I'm going to turn that light off and um, I have a question. Go, go ahead, Bert. Um, I, I just have a request um, as both Chad and Marty were going through the uh, TID 14, TID 16, TID 18, TID 20. I am fairly familiar with the TIDs, but even I get lost. So if, if on future documents it says uh, TID 16, the river to Niagara, or uh, TID 14, Myers, uh, it, would, it would help facilitate our brains with what we're really talking about. Thank you. We'll, we will add that. All righty. Sounds good. So what... Um, any questions on or uh, statements on department budgets as presented? All right, then let's move back to 3.6, which is establishing the 2021 budget appropriation and tax levy for uh, use during the calendar year. Um, Todd? Or who who wants to take that? Well, thank you, Chair. I guess the the question really comes back to um, what information would you would your committee like to to hear about? Um, all of the information is in the uh, budget and brief. If you look at the budget facts on page twelve, uh, you can you can see what the assessed tax rate is. So I don't know what you would like me to to review. Um, just in general. I will say that our 2021 budget is much tighter uh, than what we've had in past years. Uh, the team has done a fantastic job in tightening its belt. Um, we did put money into training and uh, for our Munis upgrade, which we are many years behind. But overall, um, everybody did tighten their belt and look for ways to uh, cut, cut costs. We were very, uh, very lucky as a city 
when it comes to um, routes to recovery and uh, CARES Act dollars. Uh, just to kind of give an overview, uh, transit took a, a large hit and they will be taking a hit for the next three years, um, just trying to cur curb, our, curb our, our expenses. Um, but we do have to remember that, you know, once we get through this, this pandemic that we have to be able to uh, get things back in, in to norm. Uh, you're going to obviously you can see that the revenues have been adjusted for uh, 2020 and um, estimated for 2021 and we've been very conservative on that. So overall, I hope that the the council and the and the committee accept this uh, this budget um, as it's been very tight and you can only get so much uh, blood out of a rock. So if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, uh, the budget in brief does have the information that I believe you're looking for. So, well, it does, but I mean, I think that this is an opportunity for us to take a look at things. I guess my, my deal has always been, um, uh, because I know there will be significant questions about proposing a budget with a scheduled deficit of 6.5 million. And then as we look at the, uh, for 2020 estimated and 19 and 18 actual, um, we have um, typically very substantial uh, excess of revenues over expenditures. Um, and uh, while I appreciate that, and that is what helps build our fund balances, um, and having done budgets myself for other organizations, I always appreciate it when we come in significantly under budget, but then I wonder, are we planning correctly? So um, is it, are we going to be able to say, Todd, to the council as a whole, that that $6.5 million deficit is likely not to be anywhere near that severe? And that is correct. Uh, every, every, all, all of the um, department heads have been told to tighten up their budgets and not fluff them as much. Some of the uh, dollars that I believe that you're referencing um, is also just because of, of uh, you know, part of the, obviously because of the pandemic. And we've, we've been, you know, we've had negative budgets in the past years, and then all of a sudden you'll have a swing of, you know, 1.9 when you had a negative 2.0 in million. So, you know, you look at that and you have a swing of basically 3.9 if in, in round numbers. Madam Chair, if I may interject, keep in mind that the major swing between 2020 and 2021 is a result of the advance ref the timing of the advance refunding of our NANs, where we are, we are recognizing $10.5 million dollars um, of, of funding or $11 million coming in in 2020 and going out of $10.5 million in 2021. And that's due to the money being received in uh, 2020, late 2020, but not being paid back until early 2021. So thank you. So when uh, we talk about this at committee of the whole meetings and at, at our final council meeting, is it fair to say that it is very likely that at the end of 2021, we will have a $6.5 million deficit? I would anticipate seeing a deficit, uh, whether it's 6.5 or less would be a result of how we function operationally and the impact of COVID through 2021. Um, but it would not be a significant improvement like millions of dollars. And the reason that the big driver of that large deficit is because we're paying back that NAN. And we'll, and I, I'm sure this is in the budget brief, but uh, just refresh my recollection. Are we anticipating or have you built in or how much have you built in, in CARES money? for 2021, if any? Right now, we do not have any uh, state funding or federal funding for the general fund. Where we have opportunity is uh, transit was provided CARES Act relief monies over a three-year time period. And we are working with transit to try to spread that out. There's certainly some transit expenditures 
um, related to their building and, and buses that uh, we certainly need to purchase, but then there is still some residual dollars that will reduce the potential actual levy paid to transit from the city, and therefore we'd, we'd retain, hopefully, in the neighborhood of $200,000 extra of, of that. Okay. Uh, uh, committee members, any questions, comments? I want to say, as, as I'm asking for a resolution to establish the, these appropriations and tax levy, um, this is the uh, document that becomes the basis for our discussion uh, in further meetings, uh, just so committee members understand it's not as if you know, this is the budget that will be approved, and it may well be the budget that is approved in the tax levy that is that is set. Um, but it is a foundational document, I guess I would say. And so with that in mind, do I have such a resolution? Move to approve, uh, but I do have one question. Oh, go ahead first, then. Thank you. Um, Public Works seems to have an increase of $4 million um, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, could, is that easily explained or is that a many different things? My recollection is they do have quite a few uh, projects. They do have some um, changes within some staffing, but the large dollar amount, I mean, on the earlier agenda item at tonight's meeting related to street projects, there is there is an increase in street projects that are being uh, budgeted for 2021. Um, to get into too much detail, I would probably tend to want to defer to David Beeble as Director of Public Works, who's not present tonight. Um, those projects mainly, oh, those, pro those projects, I'm sorry, but those projects are wastewater and the sewer um, interceptor that we've been talking about, and that was a $10 million uh, project alone. And public works will be that committee will be reviewing that budget and, and licensing will be reviewing, you know, um, a couple of other budgets and so forth. So and typically and I my memory is we certainly have a committee of the whole meeting scheduled to take a look at the whole picture. So. All right, Bert. Yeah, this is my first budget um, and the biggest chunk are police, fire, public works. And we don't have any of that here, and yet we're setting the levy limits? Well, again, this is the foundational document that is what we put on the table as we, when we get the full report. Um, it would be difficult for one committee. The theory is, is that certain committees have certain levels of expertise and relationships. So Public Works has its relationship with Public Works, uh, LHPS with, with police and fire. Um, so if I were saying to you that this is the final document and it will not be changed, then obviously the process would be pretty flawed. Um, but I think um, by putting this motion on the table, with those figures, which is appropriate for finance and personnel, um, that uh, there will be lots of other opportunities to ask questions. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah. That's kind of, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of an odd process, but it, it, it seems to work pretty well over the years. Okay, do I have my resolution? Is there a motion? Moved by me. <laughs> All right. Second. All right. Thanks, Trey. Any other discussion? All right. Um, all in favor of the resolution, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. All right. So whatever short meetings we've had, we've made up for it tonight. Um, so on, uh, I'll just note that we will be convening at 5.30 on October 19th. Um, Marty will be providing us with documents. Um, Marty, a little in advance of the meeting if possible. I know it's kind of a last minute deal, but uh, whatever you can provide 
in advance to make that run smoothly would be great. And with that, I'd ask for a motion to adjourn. Move Someone. to adjourn. Second. Second. All right, everyone's happy. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed, chair votes aye. Thank you, uh, department heads and administrator and uh, my wonderful committee members. That uh, was a good discussion. See you next week.